This program made possible in part by grants from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. And the UCF College of Medicine, where our goal is to become America's leading partnership medical school and a national leader in medical education and research. And the UCF College of Nursing, which offers high-quality, innovative academic programs that reflect the health care needs of a changing population and meet the needs of today's students. Hello everyone, welcome to For Your Health. I'm Ed Highland, And I'm Kiarna davis Wiese. On today's show, the fashion world is in an uproar over an Italian designer's use of an anorexic actress on a billboard. Critics say the billboard glamorizes the very illness it's supposed to be speaking out against. But if nothing else, the campaign highlights the complexities surrounding body image and health. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo. School populations draw from all segments of society, so that's where social workers can have their biggest impact. I'll have that story. And watching what you eat now means more than counting calories. It means understanding how elements from the environment can affect certain functions within your body. But first, an update on health news from UCF. A new UCF study says that by integrating medical websites into nursing homes, staff can respond more effectively to their patients' needs. In a time when most states lack necessary funding for nursing care facilities, eHealth Resources will give nurses greater access to important medical information and allow for better patient care. This study was published by researchers from the Public Affairs Doctoral Program. Even in their first semester, UCF nursing students get to interact with people, particularly children, in community-based clinics. It pays off. Recently, the grandmother of a middle school student reported her grandson was able to prevent an asthma attack because UCF nursing students had taught him new breathing methods. Through these community nursing coalitions, UCF nursing students really learn and give back in real-world settings. Several UCF programs are among the top 100 university programs in the nation, according to U.S. News & World Report. For example, the College of Health and Public Affairs' Speech-Language Pathology Program ranked number 87. Three recent UCF Cardiopulmonary Sciences graduates have been selected for coveted 24-month internships in pediatric respiratory care at Duke Medical Center. Only five slots were available, and three of them were filled by UCF graduates Angela Gutierrez, Van Lewark, and Christine Kearney. And a final note, Karen Guin, Director of Communications of College and Health and Public Affairs, and who often reports for these updates, has been named COPA's a and Employee of the Year. All of us at For Your Health extend our congratulations. This is Jerry Klein, For Your Health. You've probably heard of selenium. It's a trace element our bodies need, and it largely comes through our diets. But as Alicia Callanan Mandigo found out, researchers are discovering new ways in which selenium acts within our bodies. This University of Central Florida lab is working like labs all over the world to unlock one of the greatest cancer mysteries, and that is how things in our bodies and things in the environment interact. In this particular case, researchers are looking at the interaction between the trace mineral selenium and arsenic. Well, the project uh, that we're discussing today is one which is um, focused on a hypothesis that exposure to arsenic and arsenic-containing compounds in the environment leads to a decrease in our selenium nutrition or the status of selenium in, in tissues. So uh, the basis of it is, is that if you're exposed to arsenic in higher concentrations, then at the cellular level, you're not getting the, enough selenium. Selenium is important for fighting off oxidative damage and oxidative stress. So basically, the hypothesis we have, and others, others around the world are, are also testing, is that your exposure to arsenic reduces selenium levels, then that's going to lead to oxidative damage, which then in turn can lead to cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and other diseases 
and these diseases are known to be associated with exposure to arsenic. Why that's important is we don't know how arsenic does what it does in terms of exposure and, and the downstream uh, diseases. This research may sound a bit esoteric, but it's really not. Selenium comes to us through our diets. Arsenic exposure, well, that can come from just about anywhere. Studies on selenium are relatively new, with the first studies coming out only 30 years ago. New information on what role selenium plays is still unfolding. One interesting thing is that the project that looks at how arsenic affects selenium, we serendipitously discovered how we might treat bacterial infections that require selenium. In other words, bacteria, there's a very small class of organisms that are bacterial pathogens. Uh, one is called Clostridium difficile, which is a, a really, really nasty nosocomial pathogen that's emerged in hospitals and nursing homes and things recently. And we've discovered and published one paper in my lab that it requires selenium for growth. So since it's a very small group of bacterial pathogens that have this, this really interesting uh, biochemistry pathway, uh, we've actually found some novel uh, chemicals, some of them even drugs that are used in the clinic now, that can block the growth of this pathogen. That finding came from a gut feeling Dr. Self decided to follow, and that kind of instinct and discovery may someday answer the questions regarding arsenic, selenium, and cancer, which would bring hope to millions worldwide. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo for your health. Early 1930s research identified selenium as a poison. Scientists now understand that not, not only do we need selenium, one recent study suggested it may help fight prostate cancer in correct doses. Well, media images of fashion models have so distorted body image for young women that an Italian fashion designer recently featured an anorexic model to call attention to just how severe that distortion is. The billboard is frankly shocking and was meant to be sobering, but some critics say instead it's glamorized anorexia even more. The complicated relationships between food, eating, and appearance reach far beyond the catwalk. Joining us now to talk about this is Dr. Stacy Dom, the director of the Laboratory for the Study of Eating, Appearance, and Health. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I, I know what he was trying to do by doing this billboard, but I don't think it's going to, may, I, I'm certainly not an expert, I don't think it's going to help uh, 15-year-old girl who was watching, there was a, a show about choosing models on, and they brought in a nutritionist to do the body fat of these girls, and the one was so skeletal, the nutritionist is literally yelling at her, and there's another who's absolutely gorgeous, she's right, she's terrific, she's perfect. The next scene, the one who was the good body weight was told, you can't fit into these jeans, you're never going to be a model. I don't know that that one billboard is going to counteract the rest of the images that we're getting. And you're right, it won't. But the media has been under fire for so long now, responsible for showing so many images that make young girls feel that thinness is the only thing worth pursuit, that in order to be considered attractive, you have to be really underweight. It's not just thin now, it's those models are typically underweight and their body mass index indicates that they are not healthy. So they've put out so many images for which they've been criticized heavily that the idea of using the media power for good to try to send messages that it is not a healthy lifestyle, I think th they are trying to do the right thing, using the same influence that they've been criticized for for trying to do something positive for young women all over the country. It's just they have so much to fight against. Yeah, I mean, if you look There's at so how many on images, side. exactly, and on, on the images where they'll show this is a person who's too thin and, and they, they're struggling with an eating disorder, for young girls who are already struggling, they're actually role models. They look at that and it sort of triggers their eating disorder to say, oh wait, I'm not that thin. They're not paying attention to the content, they're reacting to the image, which to us is shocking and negative, but to someone who's already in the throes of an eating disorder, they don't see it the way we do. Now, how's the laboratory going to help this, uh, this, this situation, which, which seems to, as we're just discussing here, it goes from one end to the other, and there doesn't seem to be a happy medium, which is treating and, and helping individuals who are suffering with eating disorders and body image disorders. Right. Well, our goal is to do as much research as possible to understand how it is that we're all exposed to these images. We see the commercials, the billboards, et cetera, but we don't all get eating disorders. 
thankfully. It's actually a fairly small percentage of the population, more than we want, and it's an important problem to look at and to treat because it has really dire consequences. It's one of those disorders within psychology that can lead to death. It's a very serious problem. We want to give it as much attention as possible. But trying to understand how do people do well in this environment, which is toxic in so many ways. Images of underweight females considered ideal. Fast food on every corner. So many messages that you should look perfect, but so many opportunities to eat poorly, exercise less, and not be healthy. And so trying to understand what keeps people doing well in this kind of environment is really important to us. And understanding what the effects are of the media, of familial relationships, what mom or dad says or does, or siblings, and looking at so many variables that influence what happens during those years when girls stop feeling like they're just the greatest, they're on top of the world, and start becoming very self-conscious and very concerned about how they look. How about heredity? How, about, how much a role does that play? There are a number of studies and that biological focus trying to find is there something about the brain, is there a genetic marker for this, is a thrust within the eating disorders research nationally. That's not the emphasis of our lab. We look at things much more psychologically. But my concern is that even if we were to identify what it is in the brain that causes the development of eating disorders, we, we're probably not going to be able to do as much about that as quickly as trying to help girls figure out how to navigate our culture without having to internalize all these messages that you're just not good enough. And really, what it, we are in a very competitive culture. You have to be the best, look the best, have the most. And this is just getting expressed more and more in very physical, superficial ways. And so trying to bolster self-esteem at a young age trying to get parents to model healthy behavior, which includes self-acceptance. It's one thing for us to sit our little girls down and say, it's OK, you should feel really good about yourself, and then turn away and say, boy, do I look fat in this. Mm -hmm. what, which do they pay attention to? They pay attention to what they're living, which is seeing people around them, people very close to them, either not caring about their health, not exercising, not eating well, and obesity is not really uh, noteworthy problem in our culture. We have both extremes to worry about. But our culture is so anti-fat that we're taking all of these measures to prevent childhood obesity, potentially at the expense of preventing eating disorders. And so we have to really focus on health, teaching children and adults, it's never too late to learn, to really value how your body feels and what it does. Do you see the problem, obviously girls tend to be the focal point. In the media, mm -hmm. you see the, uh, the anorexic uh, figures, the model type figures mm -hmm. and such. Do you find it with boys, though, very much, young boys in particular? Uh, uh, usually uh, body image for, for a guy, if you will, is usually the, the bigger person and bigger is, is, is important. I want more right. muscles because that makes me more masculine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an opposite swing of the pendulum there. It's, the issues are different, but they are also important because for boys who are unsatisfied with how they look, they're not as likely to want to starve themselves to meet a thin ideal, but to get as muscular and well-defined as the ideals that they hold up and, and value, they sometimes want to take steroids. And they become obsessed with exercise. And they do unhealthy things as well. So the consequences are different, and their issues are different. But we are finding that when we look specifically at boys and men and ask them the kind of questions that are relevant to them, they're also dissatisfied with their appearance, different aspects of it. So a very common trigger, if you will, but just manifested in different ways depending on the gender. Exactly, and what the ideal is. For men, there are just as many men who want to lose as gain weight because of the ideal being larger, bulkier, muscular, more masculine. Whereas for women, it's pretty clear the ideal is on the low end, and so most women or even girls I once lose interviewed weight. a teenager, who, a, a boy who had anorexia, and he wanted to look like a rock star how mm -hmm. thin they are and mm -hmm. it was it was it was quite unusual looking at the Mick Jaggers or uh, mm -hmm. some of the other folks who it are is. more popular mm -hmm. these days are about this big around mm -hmm. and now we're looking at things like binge eating disorder which is more of an equal opportunity disorder and that males and females both suffer from eating large quantities quantities of food feeling really out of control and feeling the need to compensate for that by 
purging or over-exercising or doing something to deal with that um, only on occasion. So it's not necessarily bulimia where we see more females, but for, for males also having that out of control feeling while eating is becoming something that we're paying more attention to. We're going to talk more about uh, eating disorders, body image, and much more with Stacy Dunn in just a few minutes. And we're also going to update you on the UCF Medical College. Stay with us. And we're here once again talking with uh, Dr. Stacy Dunn about uh, body image, eating disorders, and uh, we were talking a little bit during the break about video games. I like to play video games, and you don't think about it too much sometimes when you're out there playing, but the characters in those video games have very distinctive body images, and outside of the, the grotesque ones, the monsters and the creatures you're trying to get after sometimes, uh, the women have a certain image, the men have a certain, you know, usually they're large and muscular and that type of thing. Are, you know, what kind of message are we sending to, to boys probably in particular because they're the, the, the video game fanatics these days. Kind of like the old comic books yeah. almost. Exactly, and we, we think so much about print ads and television, but we've become interested in our laboratory in looking at video games, just like you're saying. What do those images have in terms of impact on what they think people should look like or how they feel about themselves? And uh, one of my students, Betsy Waugh, completed her thesis looking at this, and so far the good news is it doesn't seem to translate into real life in that they don't judge women a whole lot differently uh, than people who don't play as many video games. We were shocked at how we did a uh, sample with UCF undergraduate males and they are playing a lot of video <laughs> games. Oh, well, surprise. And so, right, well, it's like a full-time job when you add up the, the hours. And so we thought it's really important to look at what they're spending all of this time with. Is it having an impact? And we found that when the guys really compare themselves to the characters, the male characters in the games, that's when they're more likely to have dissatisfaction with their own appearance. But in terms of judging women, the the images that they show in those video games are so unrealistic with real, what we call um, waist to hip ratios where they're really big on top and really tiny in the middle and then that hourglass gone extreme. But isn't that the Playboy extreme. syndrome? At least it was it, at one time. It is, it's perhaps right. changed now. It, it is, but when we look at uh, ideals, we're typically using these scales that really show thinness or heaviness. We don't have these highly sexualized images to have them rate, and so we might need to develop new ways of measuring things like what what are your ideals and how does that impact how you treat people in the real world. How about the music videos? <laughs> the same, same issue, they keep showing females in a highly sexualized, mm -hmm. unrealistic manner and the more we continue to buy all that kind of media or buy into it, it, get, it gets supported. What about the publicity that is given uh, in a positive sense to the, f there's the food pyramid which is much discussed and then on the other side of the spectrum there's things like uh, vegetarianism, people getting away from meats and, and from mm -hmm. going toward more of the natural foods and this type, at least there's a lot of discussion of it. Are, are we have, is, is there a positive impact? Are you seeing any of that in your research where people are starting to pick up on some of that mm -hmm. and, and, and really translate into something that's, that's healthy? Well, in our work on vegetarianism, what we were interested in finding out was, are people using vegetarianism, I'm a vegetarian, as a way of having a socially acceptable way of rejecting food? So it's not that I'm philosophically against eating beef, it's that that has so many calories and lots of fat. And so to come home and pro proclaim to a parent, I'm a vegetarian, might have been a way just to say, I don't want to share the reasons why I'm Xing out all of these foods off my list. Uh, but what we have found is that in previous research they used to say people who were vegetarians were higher in eating disorder symptoms. But it's because of the way the questions are asked. If you say there are certain foods I won't eat, that goes toward, up. Oh, that's a symptom of an eating disorder, but what we're finding is that there are vegetarians 
who eat well and they're not underweight and they don't value thinness to an extreme, they just prefer not to consume meat I've products. I've some vegetarians who can lose a few pounds, actually, so <laughs> yes. It right, does so uh, we're, we're not finding that. But there are times, and, and I think that is one of the warning signs, especially when a young person starts to say, I don't want to eat meat or anything else, to make sure that you understand what that's about. So what are the symptoms? You, uh, a child comes home and says, okay, I'm a vegetarian. How can a parent, what can a parent look at to guide whether or not they're trying to hoodwink them so to speak. Right. Well, I think you want to look at what else is going on. If they say, I'm a vegetarian and I'm for world peace and they're doing all these other things as they become more socially conscious, that's a different scenario than you see that they're starting to lose weight or they're becoming very self-conscious about their appearance, starting to cover up more, become really concerned about aspects of their physical appearance that are beyond what we would expect developmentally for any middle schooler who recognizes, oh wait, there are people of the opposite sex looking at me, I need to worry about how I come across, but that they're really shutting down from that process. Usually when an eating disorder develops, there's a lot of social withdrawal and not wanting to be dating or putting themselves out there socially, but to really start exercising a lot more and expressing concern about their appearance and their weight. What about the fact that we work on a college campus and that you go around and it's, and it's the style today, you don't <laughs> seem, see a lot of shyness. And I don't want to sound like an old fogey here, but you know, body, you don't, you body don't see it high school campuses either. Well, that's true too. <laughs> right. Body image does school. not seem to be manifesting itself for the most part. It's not right. something that just jumps out at you and say, oh, right. that person is obviously hiding or there's some kind of an issue. It just, mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem to be there. So how, that right. must make your job incredibly hard when it starts to try and to analyze about how you're going to work on the treatment and aspects. It's so right. in your face to the girls and boys who mm -hmm. are feeling self-conscious when everybody's walking around literally half naked. It, it, it's true and you're right our job is harder because one of the things we used to see was people with anorexia would wear layers of sweats and all kinds of things to cover up and now we're seeing many more people even with anorexia who are still kind of showing it all and we see the extremes of people who are overweight wearing those same styles and looking comfortable with themselves which if you have to send a message that I think is okay, it's I'm comfortable with myself. I don't necessarily think that's great for a college campus, but I think that you're, you're right in that we have to look at more subtle signs at times. And really it's how is a person doing overall? There are times, for example, when you first start college where there's so much stress that you find the one thing that you can latch onto where you still feel some sense of control. And so you start monitoring what you're eating and how many calories. And in terms of bulimia, they call it a social contagion, where female groups of students might get to know each other's tricks and really be supportive of fairly unhealthy behavior. Dr. Stacy Dunn, so much to talk about. We'll have to have you back sometime. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Well, there are lots of changes and new plans for the UCF College of Medicine coming to our Lake Nona campus in 2009. Here's a look. Well, the recruitment process is fun because we get to go out and talk to young people about our medical school. And it's actually already started. Our director of admissions is going out to colleges and universities in Florida and some around the country. And students are showing up in record numbers uh, to hear about our program and learn about the process. And the process for application to medical school is the same for all schools. It's a national process. It's online. It opened in June. And students go online and they fill out an application. And then they simply check the boxes of all the schools they want. And the application goes to all of those schools. And then once they arrive at the schools, the schools have what we call secondary applications. So there may be some specific questions we want to ask our students that they receive. And then they respond to that. So um, it's wonderful to, to see the little UCF box lined up with all the other schools and our scholarship program has been an incredible draw. The average debt in 2007 for a graduating medical student is, was $140,000 which means that there are many students graduating with debt in excess of $200,000 and our scholarship program will provide tuition and living expenses so if a student lives the way most students do, they should have no debt from medical school if they come to UCF. And if you think about starting your life with $150,000 to $200,000 of debt versus 
without that debt. It's a huge draw, and um, we hope that our program will be an equal draw. We expect to get a large number of applicants. Uh, uh, we, we could have somewhere between uh, two and 4,000 applicants for the 40 spots in our class. Social workers can also play a role in supporting our emotional health, most notably in our schools. Alicia Callanan Mandigo reports. Hey, is this person looking at me funny? Maybe they don't like me. Now I'm feeling bad or self-conscious. How might I react in that situation? I am a school social worker and I work in Seminole County Public Schools and I'm on a special team in the county called the Behavior Support Team. And so part of what I do is go around to all 12 middle schools and I go into social personal classes which are a piece of the um, Emotional and Behavioral Disability Program and I help teach those classes with the teachers. These students are not Marie Armentrout's regular students. These kids are gifted kids who volunteered to show us how a session with a school social worker might go. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm now feeling bad about myself. These students make it look easy, but working with truly emotionally disabled students can make for some tough days. I think um, you have to remind yourself of where these kids are coming from and not take it personally, and you really have to be committed to every day is a new day, every day is a fresh start for these kids. After completing her master's in social work at the University of Central Florida, Armin Trout seized upon a job opening within Seminole County Schools. The students she works with lack social skills. They have poor judgment and often come from difficult backgrounds. For those kids, school social workers play a critical role. Nationwide, they have the worst outcomes than any other students that are any other disability or, or exceptional ed category, speech language impaired, specific learning disability, educably mentally disabled, um, they have the worst outcomes. They have the worst graduation rates, uh, they have the highest incarceration rates. So when you don't have programs to support these kids who usually have social skill deficits, they just, they don't know how to uh, relate socially with people in a pro-social way, in a constructive way. Um, you're, you're having kids that are going to turn into dropouts and, you know, their options dwindle and because they don't have those social skills, they don't know how to build a positive social support system around them and so their options are dwindling and, and they end up in jail or, you know, uh, worse. Seminole County would actually like to expand its use of social workers so they would have more social workers visiting fewer schools. But that, of course, is dependent on funding. Now, three years into the program, Armin Trout is able to see changes in some students. Some of our kids are making better decisions, I would say. Um, they're actually able to sit down and reflect on what they've done and how to change what they're doing. If we had the funding, I wish that every school could have a social worker that does what I do in that school that could spend five days a week in that school being that positive relationship and meeting with these kids. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo for your help. So in this very complicated world, social workers are becoming a very important part of our schools. That's going to do it for us for today. I'm Charna Davis-Wiese. And I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time on For Your Health.